Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as Turf Teacher. Welcome to Water Management 1. This course has been approved by the uh, North Carolina uh, Irrigation and Lysing Board for one technical or irrigation hour. It comes from the textbook, um, Chapter 14, uh, entitled Water Management. It comes from the textbook, the special edition by David Assauter. Um, it's for the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Lysing Board. Uh, the textbook is entitled Landscape Construction, North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board Manual of Practice. Um, we actually used uh, the original version of this textbook in HOR 114, Landscape Construction, and uh, wanted to, uh, to bring this into some irrigation CEUs. I really felt like that uh, Chapter 14, Water Management 1, is a uh, very good... Uh, chapter and so I sent it into the board uh, and they approved it for one CEU so um, again good textbook good author and a very good chapter uh, talking about water management and so you know what do you think about when you hear the word water management I mean there's several things that can uh, you know come to play or come to your mind uh, when you think about that and you know we're always going to think irrigation water gauge irrigation water management because that's what we're in the business of doing but water management um, can also mean um, you know storm water management you know how do we get storm uh, water off the site how do we hold it on the site and release it slowly uh, back into uh, you know uh, downstream and it can also mean um, you know, managing the water that we use uh, in uh, the uh, everyday household, you know, washing, washing clothes, washing dishes, you know, what do we do with that gray water? Is it a way that we can, uh, um, you know, reuse it in the landscape um, for, for irrigation water? So we're going to touch a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about, um, you know, a water budget. That has really caught my interest and that is something that I like doing. And I think that is something that we should all learn a little bit more about um, when it comes to irrigation is preparing a water budget for our clients. So let's go ahead and get started with water management one. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at our objectives. And we have five uh, objectives um, that we're going to, to look at in the uh, in the course uh, the first one is identify identify ways that water impacts the landscape you know how much water are we using what does the rainwater do to our landscape how much rainwater is available uh, to our plants within our landscape and everybody thinks oh we get this big rain um, you know hey we don't have to irrigate or whatever but you know guys when it comes to uh, plants being able to have access to access to that water depends uh, so much on our soil, so much on our soil. And, um, you know, if we don't understand our soils, we're not going to really understand how water affects uh, our turf grass or our plant materials. Second, we're going to select appropriate methods uh, to manage water in the landscape. Um, so what, what are some typical ways that, that we can do? Can we use uh, rain barrels to help irrigate um, some of our shrub beds and, and things of that nature. And thirdly, uh, determine the water needs of a landscape. And that's, uh, you know, getting into, um, you know, preparing a water budget for our clients. And then fourth, we are going to plan for water management. How do we plan for that? What things do we need? Do what do we need to take into consideration? Um, do we need to take in, you know, consideration the the amount of uh, average monthly rainfall for the property? We need to look at all of that, and that's going to help us plan for it. And then plan for storm water runoff. And as you guys know, this is 2018. It's been one of the wettest years that we've had in a while. Um, you know, with the hurricanes that came through. Uh, you know, we've had a bunch of storm water. And then, you know, we're here in the triad. You know, we've done several jobs uh, since uh, all the rain that we've had. And definitely when the hurricanes come through of actually going back and, and actually having to um, to do a lot of storm water 
um, management uh, jobs for clients. You know, basements were flooded. You know, we're having to pop pipe off new downspouts. We're having to, uh, you know, the other ones got stopped up. And, and a lot of times, guys, you know, you know, smaller pipe. We've actually seen some downspouts, four-inch downspouts, emptying into some three-inch corrugated, you know not so good pipe you know the cheaper cheaper brand so you know it was a homeowner special but you know you know particular job we did the the entire basement had flooded you know they had to replace some sheetrock so you know they called us to see what we could do and you know we added several catch basins used slick wall pipe um you know six inch pipe to get this water moving out and you know since then since the last hurricane because we've had a lot of rain since then no water in the basement so you know you've got to plan for this and and to make sure everything is uh, uh, good to go and you know there's always going to be those 100 and 200 year uh, floodplain storms that come through but you know you still otherwise need to be prepared for that so all right so the introduction sustainability a big big word that is going around in the landscape industry now i remember back when i was studying landscape architecture in the early early 90s uh, i remember hearing this word for the very first time because my instructors my professors uh, they all had a firm together and it was called sustainable landscape design studios now i'm not sure if they're still managing it or practicing it um, you know couple of them has retired one has since passed uh, you know from from my undergraduate studies um, great group of professors but this is where I first heard what sustainability was or sustainable and guys to be honest with you you know I think really you know we may not truly understand what sustainable is but you know we're real close to being it for one we love the outdoors we love the environment so we have that natural tendency to do things that are sustainable but if you look at the diagram that's over here you have the social aspect the environmental aspect and the economic aspect and I had one of my professors once tell me you know you're not sustainable if you're not making a profit and that goes back to the whole thing of economics you know not only does it apply to your client and to to the environment itself but you've got to put money in your pocket to be sustainable but you know really study that and look at the center of it you know you have the sustainable which uh, you know encompasses if the environment is balanced you know mixing with social that's bearable if it, the social is is going together well with economics it's equitable and then you know if the environment and the economic side is, is getting along it's viable and all of those together makes it sustainable but it is the new word in landscaping has been around for you know some time but everybody's on that kick again and that can be profits for us um you know that that we can that we can uh, use in our business and, and teach our clients about how to do it and water management is the one way and so managing water is just one aspect of being sustainable whether it's dealing with irrigation water um, storm water and even water used in construction how many times uh, as a landscaper you're working in a new neighborhood you've got uh, new builders in there and you see the brick masons out there that's got the uh, you know temporary water uh, pipe sticking up out of the meter so they can you know lay the brick and the foundation and you see mud all over the site and it's in the middle of July and we haven't had any rain but there's mud all over the property it's where they've been letting uh, you know the water just run or it's a leaky hose leaky faucet that they're actually using to to do the brick so um, that is a big issue you know there's a lot of water wasted in construction because people aren't taking that into consideration and we uh, you know we need to, to to help educate the builders and the clients hey that you know we don't need to waste all this water and so uh, look at the new technology that's coming out with the irrigation I mean uh, I honestly think we're just getting ready to see um, new more and more new te net technology come out uh, in irrigation I think we're we're, we're just starting to see that and then with storm water I'm glad to see municipalities starting to come in and, and actually uh, 
you know, have tax base uh, based on your stormwater um, discharge that's going back out into it. So, you know, they're, they're making these commercial properties hold water on site and releasing it slowly, um, you know, downstream. So, you know, we're, we're all taking part in this, and this is all making it um, very sustainable. And then technology, again, has made it so possible for uh, the landscape and the irrigation contractor uh, to, to be sustainable. And guys, you know, and, and, and think about this not only in a, in a water management way, but, but think of the technology that you're using um, in your everyday business um, um, that, that's helping you every day. You know, we've moved from a paper invoicing and um, check writing to our employees, you know, doing direct deposit, email and invoices. I mean, just think of the uh, the less paper that we're using. You know, when I first got started in the business working for my parents, uh, you know, right out of college, I mean, heck, I mean, we were still doing handwritten estimates. You know, my I remember my mom still handwriting checks to people, you know. Now all that's, you know, handled electronically. So uh, another good way that we are sustainable. All right, so planning. In the planning for water management, it is the initial initial uh, step in planning for water management. Um, we need to incorporate it uh, while the project is underway. Um, well, not only underway, but way before it's underway. If you start doing it while the project's underway, you're going to just ask for failure. You need to sit down and actually plan out um, you know, what you're going to do in the project. How are you going to water the plant material um, that is being planted before the irrigation system's even um, up and running. So, uh, you know, we're all working for builders. We're working for home builders, large commercial GCs. You know, it's go, go, go. You know, they call you uh, two weeks before you really need to get in there. So you're, you're doing all this work because they've got, um, you know, finish dates that they've got to, um, to, to meet. Their deadlines have to be finished. So uh, we need to start trying to, to see how we can actually plan uh, for water and water management in this. And then if we plan it properly, it, it's not going to be an issue. It's actually going to benefit us. And so planning begins with the design professional. Hopefully uh, we're allowed in on the design process or we are the design build contractor. Um, but, you know, if it doesn't take, take place with the, with the designer up front, um, the contractor, meaning you and the whole, and the builder that you're working for are going to be tasked with creating uh, an environment that does reduce um, water usage. And, you know, there's a lot of designers out there, guys, that do not know their plant material. Um, there's a lot of irrigation contractors who do not know their plant material. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that to be mean. Uh, but guys, I mean, we have to know the water requirements of the plant material that we're using, or if we're hired to do an irrigation job, we, uh, we need to really do a complete site inventory and analysis of the plant materials that's there, the turf grass that's there, and really know the water requirements of each and every plant, um, and, and turf grass that's, that's on the property. Uh, you know, we're, we're. We're not doing any good to our clients and we're not doing any good to the environment if we are uh, wasting uh, the irrigation water. And so, um, planning, the, the main purpose of it uh, is that water, guys, water is such a valuable resource, you know. Um, they're not making any more of it. We have to preserve it. We have to protect it, and we have to explore low water alternatives. And those low water alternatives, um, you know, could be uh, plants that require a lot less water. I mean, you know, as as, as vast and, and wide as is the range of plant materials that we can use, there are definitely... Uh, uh, low water requirement plants that we can use in the landscape and to be honest with you, you know, they you might like them Your clients might like them. So so look at that and uh, and see what we can do uh, I'm a big fan of turf grass guys. I love turf grass uh, I know it takes a lot of water to keep a, a lawn healthy, but you know, there's there's other benefits to that as well, but 
you know, we've all seen it, guys. Um, you know, now, you know, we have to use rain sensors. And, you know, you know, I was in a conference not long ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and everybody was talking about, you know, they're going to do maintenance on uh, existing systems and that the client doesn't have, um, um, you know, doesn't have the rain sensor on the system. And, you know, they were talking about, you know, upsell them. You know, I honestly believe if you got in front of your clients and, and, and showed them that this is going to save them money, save them water, that that, uh, you know, that low investment of a rain sensor, I mean, guys, I mean, come on, they're not that expensive. Um, upsell it, you know, put it on the systems that you're maintaining. Just because the last contractor didn't put it on, you know, whether that was before the, you know, the board required it or, you know, it was years ago, there's nothing wrong. I mean, we're, we're trying to talk about um, changing out some of these nozzles and, you know, using uh, better nozzles that's going to reduce water. So why not, why not upgrade them to a new clock? Why not upgrade them to the rain sensor? There's nothing wrong with doing that. And, you know, and everybody's talking about, well, I, you know, my clients aren't going to, to want to pay for this. And, and, you know, guys, to be honest with you, if, if they have an irrigation system or they've just bought a house that's got an irrigation system in it, then, you know, they've, they've probably already got money. Uh, so that comes back to that whole thing with being sustainable. You know, you've, you, you've got to make money. You've got to be economic uh, in, to, to sustain it. So, you know, they're where they're at because they've got money. Upsell them. Put that in. Uh, put that in for them and, and make yourself a little bit of money. Um, but again, guys, protect and preserve this resource that we have. Let's save uh, as much water as, uh, as we can. So the approach, we must view every project as a potential to bring water savings uh, to the client. Now, everybody's asking, well, how in the world, um, you know, why do we want to spend that much time with our client? You know, why do we want to spend that much time on the property? You know, guys, again, it goes back to educating them. You are a licensed landscape, uh, ir I mean, a licensed irrigation contractor. Well, most of you are landscape contractors as well, too. But you have a license. We're, you know, you must promote that. I am a licensed professional that is here to not only save you money, but protect the environment. And that's why I might be a little bit higher. But in the long run, it's going to save you money. It's just like, you know, trying to convince somebody to do spray foam insulation in a house. Guys, if I was to build a new house, I'm going to spend that fourteen or $15,000 extra to, to use foam insulation because I know I'm going to get my money back uh, in, in probably seven or eight years with the money that I'm going to save in a power bill, especially on the size of the house. You know, if you're building a larger home, Guys, you know, I've heard rumors that you could heat a house uh, with a candle that's got uh, spray foam insulation. So, um, you know, why would somebody not want to uh, spend a little bit more money up front uh, with using better equipment, better nozzles, having this water budget done, saving them water, saving them money uh, in the long run? So that's how we've got to take this uh, and go with it. You know, from design to maintenance, any step that we can use that, uh, you know, uses lots of water, we have that potential uh, to save it, to save water and to save money uh, for our clients. So landscape design, my favorite topic in the entire whole wide world. I love design. I love it. I love um, designing pretty much anything. And I remember when we first touched on irrigation design, junior year of landscape architect school was hard, was hard. That was, the, to be honest with you, that was the first time I'd ever dealt with any irrigation. Um, I think it would have been a lot easier if I would have been in the field installing systems. I could have seen it a little bit better, but designing irrigation systems on paper uh, before actually installing them just made it a little bit more difficult. But I, uh, uh, I praise my uh, my alumni uh, for what they uh, taught me, and the professors I had really really gave me a good introduction and in depth training uh, for irrigation design. But but what characteristics of the design will impact water consumption? So what part of it is? What do you think uh, will will actually affect it? Well, hardscapes for one, you know. 
What about it, the hardscapes? You know, where's the water going? Is there a lot of pavement on the property? Is it impervious pavement? Uh, if it, if it's not, are you know the sprinkler heads, um, you know, throwing the water all over the pavement? We've all driven by either parking lots, sidewalks, curbs, and you know, water's being thrown all over um, the hardscapes, and I don't know, you know, we just, have, you know, I've seen a lot of systems where uh, the individual uh, that put the system in, um, I mean, just really, really did, you know, what what we've always termed, you know, general coverage. Uh, you know, just rotors everywhere, water and everything. So, you know, they're not breaking it down uh, into hydrozones. They're not taking into considerations uh, of throwing it across the sidewalk or throwing it across the driveway. Uh, I mean, guys, I've seen it all, and I'm sure you have too. Uh, but what about plant materials? Um, you know, guys, when it comes to the plant materials, we've got to know the water requirements for the plant materials, but we also have to know the soil. You know, everybody thinks clay is, you know, good for, for holding moisture and everything else, but yeah, you know, clay is going to hold water um, a lot more tightly. You know, and, and people think it's crazy, but uh, when you hear that it's easier for plants to get water from a sandy soil uh, than a clay soil, uh, they're thinking, no way, Jose, you know, the water in the sand goes, you know, straight through. Yeah, I mean, it might dry out quick, but the water that's in, a, that's available in a sandy soil, the plants can get to it. It's readily available for the plant. Clay particles hold on to that water and that moisture so tightly that it's not available uh, for the plant material. So guys, you have to know your plants, you have to know the water requirements for the plants, and you have to know the soils. And the first step is to is to creating a good soil, creating a good amended soil bed for your plants is going to help um, reduce water consumption. And then last but not least, breaking it down into hydrozones. Um, you know, again, goes back to, you know, do you have general coverage, you know, full coverage? You know, separate, uh, separate your plants um, you know, with drip, uh, drip irrigation. I still, you know, my shrub bed, that's what I'm personally going to do. We're going to set up drip, uh, zone for all of our plant material. And, you know, turf grass is, is going to get, you know, your pop-ups and your rotors, you know, depending on the size of it. So, um, I love the fact that you can concentrate exact how much with the size of the emitters that you put on the drip tape and how long you run it. So we can control that very, very easily. And all of that is part of planning. So again, back, look at it. We're talking about plant installation already. Dry soil, you know. Uh, if the soil is dry, even if a wet, saturated um, clay soil, the water's not available for the plant. So we have to make amendments to it. We add those soil amendments. And even back to the installation, um, you know, You've got to work uh, the, with the soil before it's ever going to um, uh, help uh, the plant materials and get the water that they need. Um, you know, amendments are going to help with the texture. They're going to help with the structure and the wa water holding capacity uh, for the site. Uh, so we've got to, to take care of it, guys. Oh. Soil science, basic soil science is a big, big thing. And, and one thing that we need more training on is soils. And that will actually help us understand uh, irrigation and water management. But irrigation, make sure that uh, we um, are using components that meet the codes. Uh, make sure that we are designing it for efficient and uniform dis distribution of water again full coverage general coverage and then produce the water budget for the client and i spent several hours yesterday really really studying up on water budget and uh you know guys i have to say i'm kind of addicted to it i think that's going to be my new niche now for our clients and for and for my students is is um uh really getting more in-depth knowledge uh on it and uh and really 
really getting involved with this, with the municipalities and the, you know the inspectors that are out there doing it. So uh, again, you know, get the right stuff, get the right equipment, spend a little bit more money uh, on the better rotors, the better pop-ups. I mean, you know, guys, there's there's a ton of great uh, suppliers out there, and there's also the ones that, that that we shouldn't be doing it. And guys, you know, I know, and you know, we've been guilty of it in the past before. Um, and you know, and for instance, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know. We all learn from our mistakes, and as industry professionals, I'll always tell you uh, our mistakes. And I don't necessarily see this as a mistake, but I see it. Um, you know, we were doing a ton of O'Reilly auto parts at one time all over the southeast, and, um, you know, they wanted an irrigation system. And you're like, well, why do they want an irrigation system? I mean, we're putting down Bermuda side, um, you know, uh, we're hand watering stuff. I mean, we were in there just two to three days before the store manager took over, and, you know, the contracts were written up by the general contractor that we're not responsible for any plant material once the store manager takes over. And so, I mean, guys, I mean, seriously, we were there, you know, we're adjusting irrigation heads, we're, we're putting out mulch, we're doing the, you know, a little bit of the cleanup. When they're, you know, stacking the shelves uh, and getting ready to open up the very next day. And so, you know, store manager comes in, once the store manager says, hey, it looks good, job superintendent looks good. You know, we put in a, a nice irrigation system for them and spent a lot of money. Well, guess what they do? The, the, the store manager will look you in the eye and say, man, I'm turning that system off. Yeah, we paid for, for two meters out front. We paid for the backflow. We've got a nice system in here. But the, the, the problem was that the store manager's um, salary come based on total profit. And he's like, if I'm spending money watering plants, that over a year's time is going to reduce my salary. So they turned it off, turned it off. And so many times that, you know, we'd have to go back, um, you know, for small little things. And, um, you know, we'll walk back into the store and the irrigation controller, it's it's turned off. It's turned completely off. They've turned it off at the street, the controller's off. So we started, you know, why are we spending all this money on, on good stuff, you know? So we started buying the cheapest controller and the cheapest heads because only we're going to run it was three, you know, three or four days max, and they turned the thing off. Our warranty was up. Once the store manager took over, we were respond, we weren't responsible for anything, um, you know, which was good because we were traveling all over the place doing them. But still, you know, it kind of come back to that whole ethical thing. Should I be buying, um, you know, this cheap controller, putting it in? But we knew it was coming off. So again, sorry, I'm off on my soapbox. Uh, but you know, it just, it, it kind of bothers me seeing guys out there using products that, that aren't commercial grade, you know, you shouldn't be buying this stuff and putting it in people's homes, you know, yeah, it's, it's for, it's designed for the do it yourselfer. Stormwater. Wow. Big thing. I love this picture here. Love this picture. You know, <laughs> I don't think I'd get too close to that water running like that, uh, with my, uh, with my stroller there and my, my young child in it. But, you know, guys, is there a way possible that we can collect this stormwater and reuse it for irrigation? You know, definitely from gutters, you know, we can collect the, the roof water and actually, um, you know, use it for, for uh, I mean, you know, you can even use it to wash your car. Uh, you know, I've seen people put the, the rain barrels out and, and, and do that. And the cool thing about the rain barrels, guys, is everybody, you know, is on that green green building kick. Well, what does that um, allow you to do? Well, people think it's cool. People are going to spend money when they think something is cool. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, we find it easier selling Christmas light installs than we do an irrigation system because, you know, yeah, irrigation systems are needed, but they're not wanted by people. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot easier to sell something that they want. They love the Christmas lights and they want it. Well, they like those rain barrels because they look cool, so they want it. So step up your game, sell it to them, introduce them to how they could use it to, uh, to water their vegetable gardens, how they can use it to water you know, their plants and the shrub beds uh, and, and actually have this cool looking rain barrel out uh, at their gutters. Containment period. How long should um, we keep it on site? 
um, you know, there's 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 several ways. You know, they've got cisterns. Uh, they've got tanks in the ground that you hold it and then release it slowly. Um, so you know, different different ways uh, to do that. And designers should include practices uh, for sustainability. Um, you know, same thing. Impervious surface, uh, impervious paving materials that we can uh, use instead of so much concrete and so much asphalt. Um, um, you know, I even love, um, you know, the, the grass pavers, you know, we done a huge job for UNCG one time, uh, you know, with the, um, you know, deep gravel base and sand and, uh, we put down these plastic crates that, you know, interlocked together and that fire trucks could drive around the, the, the building. I mean, that is, that is cool you know, reduce that pavement because yes, you've got to get fire trucks around places, but it doesn't necessarily have to be with concrete or asphalt, all kinds of ways to do that. And again, it goes back to the designer, it goes back to the designer and you guys are designing irrigation systems. You're probably doing some irrigation design as well. Incorporate that into your practice. What are our contractor responsibilities? What are we responsible for? Well, for one, we guarantee the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That's right in our license law. That's why we have a license. It's because we are protecting the general public, the health, and the safety, uh, and welfare of it. You know, we are responsible for conservation of water. They're not making any more of it. Yes, um, and I've heard that we're not really losing it. I mean, water is just this huge, you know, huge water cycle, but Eventually, that water might not be on our site uh, to use later on. But, uh, you know, conserve, conserve as much of it as possible, guys. Adhere to plumbing and building codes and land use regulations. Um, you know, extensive codes, you know, they've always existed to regulate the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, you know, and so conservation of water should not be an issue here either for you guys. Uh, landscape projects that utilize water have the potential to be governed by many codes and we need to know what they are you know most of you guys have a limited plumbing license you know so you're you're already adhering to to um, to those plumbing codes but you know land use you know you know now people are having to put retention ponds on the properties or they're having to use underground storage tanks to contain that water um, and we need to know more about it state license um you know for irrigation you know we're one of the few states that has it you know new jersey has it texas has it florida has like a limited uh license well not i wouldn't say limited license but it's not required they do have a license but it's not required by everybody and then california has one so and you know in cas california is um <laughs> big into water conservation and using it and i had the had the pleasure and and uh, real thankful for the opportunity um uh, back in the summer, to have three college professors from um, North Carolina, uh, not North Carolina, but California. We had one that was around San Diego. We had one that was kind of mid-state. Uh, and then we had one up near um, the uh, Oregon border. Uh, but these were uh, professors of agriculture, landscape, horticulture. They actually came to uh, to our community college and, and visited. And so I got to take them to dinner one night, and then we toured several botanical gardens uh, in the triad uh, over the, the period that they were here. And, uh, you know, they did some, some workshops there that we had on campus. But uh, to hear them talk about, uh, you know, everything that they have to go through when it comes to water, uh, you know, I, I, I was just really blessed to, to, to get to hear that and um, um, to hear people um, really concerned in, in, in wanting to do the right thing. You know, everybody thinks of California, oh, you know, everything's overboard, you know, um, kind of a liberal state. But no, guys, when it comes to, to, to their landscape and irrigation laws, uh, they, are, they are all about protecting, um, you know, not only the welfare and safety of the public, but, but of the water. They protected what water they had. They knew they had to have it huge agricultural state um, and so you know their laws are a lot more stricter than what we've got uh, and then EPA water sense landscaping guys and if you haven't gone to the EPA's website 
please, please do. That is an outstanding uh, website when it comes to uh, uh, doing the water budget, doing a uh, uh, landscape uh, water requirement study, you know, and it shows you exactly how to do it. You can find out what the uh, the ET rate of the zip code that you're that you're in, you know, it gets that detailed, and it shows you step by step. We're going to look at it a little bit uh, in this lecture. Um, you know, but this is a one-hour class. I mean, you could you could teach all day on how to do water budgets and uh, landscape water requirements and whether or not you know what the baseline is. I mean, we could you know spend an entire day doing that, but but take. Take a look at the EPA's website when it comes to water sense landscaping. Now, we're still talking about landscape design, you know, and I've mentioned, hey guys, we've got to know what's on the site. We've got to know what our soil is. And guys, not only doing a soil test, I mean, a soil test is going to tell you what amendments you need to add, but guys, you've got to get out there and you've got to, you know, get out there and dig a little bit. See what the soil structure is. You know, see if it is a sandy soil, if it's a loamy soil, or if it's a clay soil. Get out there and do the hand ribbon test. You know, and you've probably seen my lecture entitled Site Inventory and Analysis. It is a big, big thing. And back again to doing the O'Reilly's, you know, the architect it was an architect that, that laid out the whole property, was not a landscape architect, was a building architect. So, you know, they're still allowed to do site planning and and do, uh, you know, uh, landscape plans for zoning and stuff like that. You know, uh, their license allows them to do that. Uh, but again, we were talking about a building architect that didn't know plant material. So they definitely didn't know the soil. But the, the sad thing it is, they never stepped foot on the property. Everything was done, you know, via email and drawings back and forth. And, you know, I guess using Google Maps. But... You know, how in the world can you not visit a property and do a correct landscape plan? Now, we were responsible for designing the irrigation system. They were just, they would highlight the areas on the landscape plan that they wanted irrigated. And it was usually where they put sod and where they had, uh, you know, some of their larger trees. Uh, but if it was just grass being sown, because they didn't sod the entire properties. They only sodded their retention ponds and then they, were, they uh, sodded. 10 foot out from the building all the way around and that's where we had irrigation going so um, but how can a designer not go to a site i mean that should be the first thing you do um, and you know the lecture i have site inventory analysis i love it it's one of my favorite things to teach our students uh, it can be done very quickly um, you know especially a small residential property you get that site survey you get that from the client if at all possible uh, there's courses on my website, guys, that show you how to draw uh, a, a property very, very quickly because we, as irrigation contractors, we're responsible for doing an as-built. Well, if you go ahead and do a site inventory analysis and you know correctly with the survey, you've already got your base map done, so it's, it's very easy to do it. But what's on the site? What is your evaluation of the site? We are the experts. You know, whether we're doing an irrigation system, we still need to know our plant material. We still need to know what's on site. We need to know what species of turf grass we're dealing with. That all needs to be part of your site inventory and analysis. Um, the microclimates. What is the daily weather like in the, uh, the area? And this kind of gives a little idea. Um, people are always wondering about, hey, why is my plant... Uh, why is my plant uh, dying? Well, it, it doesn't need full. It doesn't need full. Uh, it doesn't need full shade. It needs sunlight. It needs so many hours of sun uh, per day. Uh, so you know what? What? What do we do? Maybe we need to move that plant out into full sun. Um, what is the seasonal averages? What are your temperature extremes? What is rainfall? And again, that EPA website that I just talked about. That is going to show you what the average monthly rainfall is for the entire year. You need to know that when it comes to doing a water budget. Now, you know, the average here, somewhere high 40s, I can't remember. We're already in the high 60s of inches of rain this year because of the hurricanes that have came through and just because of the, the, the summer rainfall that we've had. And then again, I just talked about it, sun or shade. 
what is going on with these microclimates that, um, you know, microclimates can be good, they can be bad, you know, and a plant that's in the shade is definitely not going to need as much water as plant material that is not. But some plants have to have so many hours of sunlight. So many uh, plants have to have so many hours of darkness. You know, look at mums. People call all the time, hey, I planted mums, you know, in a week. They look like they're dead. They're not blooming anymore. And then you go by and you take a look at it for them. You're like, well, dude, you, you got landscape lighting all over the place. Or you got this huge street light. You know, mums require so many hours of darkness to, to keep those blooms going. So all these microclimates can take we need to take into consideration when we're designing an irrigation system. And we really need to know our plant material for that. And it all boils down, guys, to our soil samples. Now, um, you know, the soil sample, guys, we need to, we need to take it, um, take the samples, um, they should be taken that differentiate slope changes. Uh, and cover crop types. Um, you know, you've, you've got to take multiple, multiple uh, sample locations on the property. Uh, infiltration after rainfall, you know, is a big thing. Um, soils that do not have good infiltration are going to pond the water up on top, uh, and it's going to allow it to evaporate, uh, or it's going to allow the water to drain off the site. I mean, last thing you want to do is have all the water drain off your site. Now. You remember me talking about the house that we did all the drains around it right after the hurricane because the client's uh, basement flooded? Well, they also had a neighbor to the right that was up on a hill. And in between the houses, um, their homeowner, ton of concrete. You know, long driveway. Um, you know, their house set up on a hill. So the concrete just sloped back towards their property and huge backyard um, that was sloped towards our client's house and so luckily our client's neighbor um, was a good guy he's like man i will i will i will help pay for the majority of this because i feel bad that it's my water running into your basement and he's like you know just let me know what you want to do i feel bad we'll help you out with this so luckily that 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 happened so when you have that runoff, guys, you know, when it runs off your property, you're not only losing that valuable water for your plants and your turf grass, but it can also be damaging somebody else's property because there's just, there's too much of it. And so, um, what if it's sandy? What if it's loamy? What if it's high salt? Um, soil that is sandy, um, uh, Needs to, you know, needs more organic matter to improve the structure and texture. Loamy soils, um, the need for modification, you know, small to none. I mean, that's kind of what we're shooting for. Um, soils that are high in salt, uh, they need tre treatment with gypsum and may also require subsurface drainage uh, be installed. So, you know, you've got to get out there and, and figure out the texture of these soils. You know, you got to have the soil tents, the, the test done, and you've got to go out there and actually take some cores and, and figure out what type of um, um, soil does your client have. Uh, a good basis, you know, everybody needs that basic soil science class uh, in the undergraduate or community college. Um, you know, it's it's just really good to know to know your soils, guys. All right. So we're getting to talk a little bit about um, our uh, landscape water budget. And, you know, I try to keep these lectures at about an hour. And so, um, you know, we're not even halfway through, so we may kind of get through this uh, or it may run over a little bit. But, uh, you know, this is one CEU. And I told you, the landscape water budget, guys, uh, you know, we could just spend an entire day talking about water budgets. Uh, it is advisable and it may be required depending on the municipality that you are working for. It is an estimate of how much water should be used. So again, guys, you got to know your plant materials if you're going to know how much water you're going to use. And it allows the appropriate amount of water usage. 
prevents paying for excessive water usage. Why would you want to run your irrigation system longer um, than, than anything else? Good friends of mine, you know, I'm doing a little patio design for them. They just moved down. Um, they moved from the country into the city and they were talking about, whoa, they did not know how much the water bill cost, you know, and they, they have no irrigation system. They're just using it for, for, for household. So, um, why would you want to use that? You know, yes, you got the separate meter. Some states may not even require that. I don't know about municipality, but here you have to put in the separate meter. Uh, that's required here in the city of Winston. And I'm sure it is in the larger other cities. Um, and then we'll look at some EPA water budget calculations. Uh, uh, but nice little diagram that come from the water budget process uh, for a typical stormwater treatment practice. So, um, you know, got the evapotranspiration happening. You got surface inflow going into it. You got some of the water that infiltrates, and then you got deep percolation. Uh, and then you've got, got it where it uh, can be released or in the outflow. So, and guys, remember, there's only about 50% of the rainwater that falls uh, is available for plant material. So everybody's like, man, we just got all this rain. We got all this rain. Why is my plants, you know, well, they still look like they're wilted. Well, they could be, you know, saturated. Uh, but also some of that water, uh, you know, 50% of it's not readily available for the plant, and it depends on what type of soil that you've got. And so here is our first equation. Um, you know, this is getting our baseline. Uh, you know, this is on page four in the textbook uh, for it. Um, but we got to come up with our baseline. And the baseline is, um, you know, the evapotranspiration rate. It's a local reference. It is in inches per month. Um, and you can find that on the EPA's website. It is, let's see if I can pull it up here. Uh, but it is uh, epa.gov um, forward slash water sense forward slash uh, water dash budget dash data dash finder. Uh, I'll put a link up in the course for you to get to it, but you can enter your zip code and it is going to pull up, um, you know, uh, your ETO value. And for us here in Winston-Salem, the zip code 27106, we have an ETO value of 6.05 inches per month. And then we have the um, area, the landscaped area in square feet. And then we have the conversion factor that you're going to see uh, multiple times. Uh, that is 0 0.6233. It results in gallons per month. And so once we take that information, you know, let's say that um, you have um, you have a designed landscaped area that is 12,290 um, square feet. Um, and you enter the average monthly reference by entering that zip code. And we have one here, an example. And I'll put this example up in the class too, which is a really, really good chart how to do it. But, you know, you enter the landscaped area. You enter the average monthly reference uh, evapotranspiration rate here at 6.43 with the problem that they give us. Um, and then that's going to give us a monthly baseline um, of 40, um, 49,219 because uh, you need to multiply it um, um, by, your, by your factor. Uh, which is the uh, the point zero six two three three, and so um, just double checking this math really quick on my calculator here. So we said we had uh, twelve thousand two hundred and ninety square feet, and again, guys, I will put this uh, PDF up on the course for you to look at. We have a landscaped area of twelve thousand two hundred ninety. We have uh, an ETO uh, reference of six point four three roughly giving us uh, 79,000 and then we're going to multiply it times our uh, 0.6233 and that is correct that gives us a monthly baseline of 49,000 
um, 200 and uh, roughly 219 ish um, gallons um, per month. And then what we do um, in part two, in equation two, so we've got our baseline of roughly 49,000, and it's going to come, you know, it's it's around that. It depends on where you guys are at with your uh, with your ETO. And so step two is the water allowance. And that's when we're multiplying our baseline uh, times 0.70. So we're taking our 49,000 roughly gallons, multiplying it by 0.7, and gives us um, uh, our water allowance, which is, you know, roughly 34,000, um, almost 500, 34,479 um, gallons per month uh, for, for this problem. So... As you can see, um, you know, fairly easy to get equation one and two. The next equation is a little, little, little rougher, uh, but this is your landscape water requirement. And um, whereas the actual problem is the landscape water requirement for the hydrozone in gallons per month is what it's going to equal. And then we have the, the DULQ, the lower quarter distribution uniformity. It is dimensionless. And then again, we have the ETO that we're multiplying it by the landscape coefficient for the highest water using plant in that hydro zone. And that uh, is explained a little bit more uh, in the PDF, which comes from the, uh, from the EPA. So um, very, very cool. Uh, print that out and study it. Uh, there may be a question or two on the 10 question quiz uh, that is required uh, for your enrollment in this course. So. Uh, it is the EPA WaterSense Water Budget Tool Quick Start Guide, and I will put that up for you guys. And we're still we're in about 52 minutes on the lecture here, and so I'm gonna try to wrap this up to keep it at an hour for you guys. Again, plant selection, ladies and gentlemen, um, is is the big thing. Um, you know, are there alternative plants with reduced water requirements? Yes, we need to find it. We need to find those native plants adapted to the seasonal rainfall and also native plants that are adapted to the soil. And then what plants are drought tolerant? You know, teaching plant materials one and two, I love that. Maybe we could come up with a course on uh, drought tolerant plants um, that could be used here in North Carolina. And then are we breaking it down into hydrozones? And, you know, I mean, we see it, we see it all the time. Um, you know, contractors, <coughs> I mean, land, uh, irrigation contractors putting, um, you know, pop-ups with rotors. And yes, you know, I took a course on that, that that can be done uh, if you did the math correctly. So yeah, it can be done, but guys, why not separate it? Again, you know, we're, you know, somebody that's hiring an irrigation contractor to do the job one, they've got, they've got money. Um, we want to save them money by saving water. You know, we don't want to save them money by skipping out on good products and not adding that extra zone that down the road is going to save them money by saving water. So, uh, you know, they've got the money up front to pay for it. Uh, amenities, fountains, pools, other streams, guys, they have the potential to waste water. What can we do to, to do that? Does the, does the waterfall capture the overspray? Does it minimize the loss of water from uh, evaporation and loss of containment? You know, how many times do you see um, water fountains that are spilling over, um, especially more in a formal garden? You know, well, you know, there's going to be winds and stuff, but, you know, I've seen it even on um, you know, calm, still days, water spilling out over the top, it's wet, the pavement around the fountain is wet, I mean, it's wasting the water, that water's going nowhere, it's evaporating, or it's running off the property, so how can we prevent that uh, from happening? Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways to design, uh, design these water features that people want to save the water. Um, you know, the following activities can assist water management when building the landscape. Practical techniques when installing the plant material. Guys, don't damage the soil. Don't compact the soil when you plant it. Make sure that you're planting the soil correct, you know, planting the tree correctly. 
giving it the room that it needs, um, adding the soil amendments that's going to help it retain moisture and make it available to the plant, mulch your plants, that's going to help keep moisture around the plant, and avoid working on rainy days. That's just doing nothing but destroying the soil. And guys, yes, home builder Bob is going to call you and say, look, I've got to get this house. They're moving in Friday. I need the trees planted because we need that certificate of occupancy. But, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we're probably going to go plant the trees on a, on a, on a nasty rainy day just because, uh, you know, they got to get the job done. But avoid it at all costs. I mean, you're doing nothing but destroying the soil when you're working um, on these rainy days. And uh, amend the soils or use cover crops until the grading is necessary. Protect soil from erosion and use hand equipment if possible. Like that's, like that's going to happen. Yes, we teach that at the college. But also tell them, hey guys, you know, if the mini excavator sitting over there or the trencher, I'm not going to be using a trench and shovel. Uh, and then again, protect existing plant material. Uh, and a lot of this, you know, this orange fence is required on a lot of construction sites, guys. Begin irrigation design with the water budget and then conduct the water audit annually. Um, you know, I love seeing these things done. They're actually fun. Uh, you know, it's a good uh, exercise, maybe a lab activity that you can uh, uh, train uh, your, your uh, uh, employees to do. And then perform an evaluation or pre-audit of selected controller zones and irrigation heads. And then calibrate the irrigation schedule weekly or at least monthly. Now, you know, me and my dad were talking about that uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I usually call him on the way to the college uh, to see, you know, what they're going to be doing and where they're going to be at. And I try to show up on the job sites as much as I can when classes are done. Um, but we were talking about, you know, calibrating the schedule. Uh, you know, you can't send somebody over, um, you know, to do this definitely weekly probably not even monthly i mean you'd have to have them on some type of uh maintenance plan but you know you know did go to uh, to some irrigation uh conferences this year and and, and love the controllers uh, that you can log in from your office and actually readjust this you know based on rain schedule based on um you know the average monthly rainfall so you know guys again technology is just getting ready to boom bust wide open when it comes to to, uh, to irrigation um, match the irrigation needs with precipitation rates uh, for the heads uh, consider using gray water you know gray water would be uh, laundry water bath water it's it's not going to be your toilets it's it's going to be uh, you know, your, your, your cleaner water, you know, they call, um, you know, when you flush the toilet, it's brown water, but, you know, collect the gray water, filter it and, and use it in the irrigation system. That's, that's an excellent, uh, thing to do. And it probably needs to be done more on new houses than existing houses, just because you need to be able to incorporate this stuff, um, uh, while you're in it. And, you know, Hey, we got the limited plumbing license to, to do back clothes, guys. Uh, you know, Get that plumbing license to help you do that as well. And replace older heads. You know, um, you know, a lot of older heads out there, guys, that need to be doing it. Luckily, the aerator will find it for you, and you get to, uh, to replace them uh, at your cost instead of the homeowner's cost. But uh, uh, you need to do that. And if you sit down and explain to them, um, you know, replacing it over time, how much money they're going to save on their water bill, you know, a lot of this will, will you know, could be, um, paid for itself when it's in a year or two. Uh, consider drip or micro systems. I love them. Water in the morning. Guys, I do not understand why I drive by a bank or a hospital and I see irrigation running at three and four o'clock in the afternoon. It happens all the time. You drive by and it's pouring down rain and you see irrigation systems running. Well, they don't have the rain sensor. Absolutely crazy. And you, and the sad thing is I know the contractor that installed the system and I'm like, dude, why in the heck did you not put the rain sensor on? And why do you have water coming on at three or four o'clock in the afternoon? You're creating an issue. You're making disease just thrive when it gets dark. Cool nights with wet grass. I mean, come on. And I know, yes, 
the homeowner probably gets out there and messing with that controller. I don't know what it is about a homeowner. That's the first thing you want to go play with, especially the, the, the man of the house. You know, lock that controller box up and then charge them a hefty fee. When, when, that, start, when that starts happening, they'll, they'll leave it alone. The wife will tell him to leave it alone when you have to start paying service calls to come out and readjust it. And set controllers for multiple short watering cycles rather than a single long cycle uh, to make sure that the water infiltrates. Good practices there for irrigation contractors. Uh, there's two problems with stormwater runoff. Loss of the resource, again, and then addition of rainwater to storm sewer systems downstream. Hey, a lot of times, guys, you know, cities are charging you a, a stormwater tax. You got to hold that water on site. You don't want to lose the water. Is there any way possible that you can use it for irrigation? Is there any way possible that you can hold it and release it slowly? Well, you know, what they're taxing you with, you're going to want to spend the money on those underground tanks. And the management of stormwater runoff has moved uh, to the forefront of designing and building landscapes. Collection, you know, we've got barrels, cisterns, dry wells, and then roof and pavement capture. You know, the barrels can capture the roof. Uh, and, you know, this one isn't so what you call attractive. Uh, but, uh, you know, the cool thing about it, you're collecting it here. Once that gets full, I mean, it's still being piped off. But you're collecting, you know, in a 55-gallon drum. You got the downspout right here, guys. I mean, this right here can hand water your container uh, plants. You could, you know, wash your cars. You could, uh, you know, give the dog a bath or do whatever with this stuff right here. Um, so, and, you know, these things can really be decorative you know, you can make it look like a whiskey barrel if you wanted to. Um, cisterns, guys, they're usually the term used for containment that stores water for reuse. Uh, whereas the, the dry wells generally, um, you know, they're, they're for containment that will send the water back out into the ground. So, uh, but this right here, guys, is green building. People love to talk about that. You know, you'll see, if you do this for a client, you're going to see it on their Facebook page. Bioswells, gradually slope drainage channel with shallow sides lined with plant material. It's going to slow the runoff while trapping pollutants and sediment. Allows water to percolate back into the soil. It can be a decorative attribute to the landscape. And yes, and this one right here in the picture, uh, very, very attractive, but I can see mosquitoes and see other types of wildlife that we may not want there, but it's better um, to hold that water and release it slowly, guys. You know, we got ways to get rid of the mosquitoes. This is very, very attractive. You know, you got the, the grasses um, that help with this. And this just makes a very, very good, uh, attractive bed inside the parking lot. But the bio said they're gradually slope channel with sides. Well, I think that's a repeat. Yep, just different pictures. Uh, and then French drain. Uh, you know, get that water off uh you know allow that water to to get back in here and to slowly um you know get off the property hold it in a tank uh, but this is one way to uh to uh to get water away from a basement and trust me we just did did a uh did a huge one uh just recently thanks to mother nature rain gardens very attractive uh thing to have it's a it's a it's a talk piece guys people are going to do it uh, tracks wildlife, creates habitats for them, allows water to filter and infiltrate back in, uh, but a good way to handle storm water. How's the rain garden work? You got your gutters and downspouts either piped off or running off into it. Uh, we can assist with directing rainwater from your roof to your rain garden. Uh, native plants are adapted to local conditions. They're easy to maintain once established. They attract all kinds of wildlife and other pollinators. Uh, the berm holds the water in the garden during heavy rains. And then the deep root plants, plants with deep root system encourage infiltration and help absorb the nutrients. So very good way to have, plus, you know, upsell it. Maintenance, techniques that manage water, plant care, mulching, the soil health. How many times have I talked about the, the soil in this lecture? And then irrigation system maintenance. You know, we've had clients call us and say, I've done nothing with my irrigation system for four or five years. You know, 
whether it's turned off, they go out there and mess with it, and you go out there and it's like, you know, you, you, you walk across the lawn and you sink in six inches where they've been running it so long. Do that. Do, do, do an irrigation system check for any property that you're managing. And guys, to be honest with you, I don't want to mow. I don't want to do landscape maintenance on a property if I don't have control of the irrigation system. I mean, that's straight up. I don't want the, ir the other irrigation contractor that put it in to do it. I'm licensed irrigation contractor. If I'm going to take care of your landscape, I need to have access to your irrigation system. And then what maintenance practices are, you know, are we using it? Guys, some, you know, things as simple as, you know, not cutting the grass so short. Uh, you know, all of that is going to help manage the water for our clients. And the reference is the textbook that I talked about in the opening lecture. And I know I ran over a few minutes. Um, but guys, this concludes Water Management 1. Uh, there will be a quiz on the classroom, and I will put up the, uh, the reference charts that I talked about. Appreciate it, guys, and I'll see you in the next lecture.